You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome Welcome to to the the Advisor's Advisor's Option, Option. the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop option strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the The Advisor's advisor's option. Option. All right, everybody, that music means we are back once again for the Advisors Option, the program here on the network for all of you out there, the busy financial advisors and asset managers. Maybe you're considering dipping your toes into these options markets. First off, welcome to you. Secondly, you're kind of late to the party. Everyone else and their mother seems like they have been just diving into these markets en masse since the beginning of the pandemic. But hey, better late than never as they always say, or maybe you want to learn a little bit more about these products or how they should work. Maybe you don't keep up with the latest developments in the world of options and derivatives. Don't worry. We got you covered. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com. So as of course, from the aforementioned network, and we have a great show. So let's just dive right into it. A lot to get to today. I'm pleased to be joined by a great powerhouse panel here today. First off, joining me as always, my compatriot in all things advisors, option crime, Mr. Matt Amberson, the principal and founder over there at ORATS, a.k.a. Options Research and Technology Services, a.k.a. the Oracle of New Hampshire himself. Mr. Matt, welcome back to the advisors, option, sir. Always exciting and, and very uh, pumped for this advisors, option. I'll let you, I won't spoil the, the surprise. Yes, much. no spoilers, no spoilers, because also joining us, an old friend of the show. You may remember him from some of the early episodes of the program. Hasn't been on in, oh, I don't know, a few years. <laughs> I think the last time he joined us, he was beaming in 
from Puerto Rico. Now he's beaming in from a little bit farther across the pond, all the way from the lack of shores of Germany. <laughs> we are joined once again by Mr. Ash Vias, now holding down Fort over there as the investment director at Resonance Capital. Ash, welcome back to the advisor's option, sir. It has been too long. It has. Uh, nice to, uh, you know, hear familiar voices, both of you gentlemen. I, I, you know, I just, as an old vol trader, I just chase vol around, whether it's hurricanes in uh, Puerto Rico or, uh, you know, World War III kind of scenarios here in Europe. You know? <laughs> yes. I'm just a vol guy. <laughs> yes, you, you moved a little bit closer to the danger zone over there, sir. Uh, we, we forget here as Americans, we have these nice wide oceans between us and a lot of madmen and you just threw that away so uh, <laughs> well done on your part sir but you know what we're glad to have you back here on the show if for no other reason than to distract you for a little bit obviously it's been a while since we've chatted with you let's start what does the investment director over there at resonance capital what do you do day to day sure uh so resonance is an investment advisor we have five billion in aum and basically what we do is we uh, invest in hedge funds on behalf of our institutional clients. Um, and so what I spend most of my day doing is, you know, helping manage the, with the investment team, helping manage the portfolio of hedge funds that we have, a lot of which are U.S. hedge funds, uh, and also trying to figure out, you know, what funds to add and that sort of thing. So basically, um, you know, very focused on the hedge fund world, but not as a portfolio manager anymore, just as an allocator. And you know what? We're really burying the lead. Since this whole pandemic started, sir, you've been quite the busy beaver. You and I back in the day used to talk about a lot of uh, historical works, historical fiction. I may have shared a book or two with you back in the day that were my personal favorites, but you've taken that to the next level. You did what a lot of us said we were going to do during the pandemic, which is you cranked out the great American, I guess now German novel over there. In fact, you've cranked out, what, five of them? <laughs> so uh, you got to you got to catch us up, sir. When did you become world renowned novelist, A.K. Vias, in your spare time, sir? Uh, I'm not sure if that trade's been filled yet, uh, but basically, you know, one of the things with the pandemic, it was a much more severe iteration in terms of lockdown here in Europe than it was stateside. Like basically, from everyone had the first lockdown, you know, in like Mar you know February and March 2020. But in Europe, specifically in Germany, pretty much from October of 2020 through like April or May of 2021, we were in strict locked German lockdown, which is basically like, you know, you can go to the grocery store and if you're caught outside your apartment past curfew, it's a 200 euro fine a day. Right. So, um, you know, there wasn't much to do. <laughs> so I just kind of started writing. I wanted to kind of write a book for my kid. And then that turned into another book and another book. And, and then you cranked out the murder mystery for your kids? Yeah, the that, that, wasn't for that, that wasn't for the kids. The first book was for the kids. And then I thought, you know what? Maybe I'll write one for the adults as well. I'm reading uh, Carnival Girls now. This is not for the kids. <laughs> no, no, that was not. No, that was not. But no, it, it, you know, it's kind of turned into a hobby. So I guess, you know, later in life, uh, you know, people grow. So it has all been during lockdown then. All, what, four or five books? So I started in lockdown. I wrote uh, The Eagle Feather, which was the first book for my kid, in lockdown. And then uh, Carnival Girls was probably, I think I finished it in June of 21. Um, so, yeah, I was, there wasn't much else to do besides work and write because you couldn't really leave the apartment. So, you know, that's what I did. Well, I am ridiculously impressed, sir. I'm one of these people I have. A lot of people don't know this, but in the days between my trading on the floor, and kicking off Options Insider, I moonlighted as some fun, uh, putting some words on the old page, just for things that interested me. A lot of historical fiction, a lot of historical writing. I was published in a lot of different uh, journals and things, but a lot of historical things. I was researching pandemics before it was cool, writing about the Black Death and stuff like that. And then I got lured to writing about options again because they paid me a lot of money to do it. And that's what kind of kicked off the whole incarnation of the Options Insider. But along that way, I wrote I'd say about three or four historical fiction screenplays that were kind of fun. I actually had an agent out in L.A. who was shopping my stuff around. I quickly learned that as a uh, a newer entrant to the screenwriting world, they're not going to buy a $200 million movie from me, right? <laughs> but it was fun. It was fun to do a lot of that stuff. And I have multiple novels in various stages of completion. I'm, I was the person saying, hey, I'm going to use this lockdown to all sorts of good uh, purposes. And you beat me to it, sir. So I both praise you and shake my fist at you. But hey, you give me, me some motivation to finish some stuff up now. So well done. So folks, before we get started, if folks want to check out your books, so what are they and where can they find them? 
Oh, oh geez. Yeah. Well, they're all on Amazon. Um, there's, there's a couple of series. There's, there's a Western series called Shannon. Uh, and that's just basically an old American Western set in uh, New Orleans and, uh, the, the Texas frontier. He's a ranger. Um, there's a prehistoric fiction series called the Eagle Feather, which is about like, you know, a tribe back in the day, you know, prehistoric times, like, you know, developing technology, trying to survive things like saber tooth and things that go bump in the night. And, and what you mentioned, uh, the, the modern book more for adults is, is Carnival Girls, which was kind of my take on Silence of the Lambs, like, you know, 20 something years later, or whatever it is. <laughs> so check them out, listeners. They are all there. You can find them on Amazon under his pen name, AK Vias. <laughs> there v-y-a-s check out i'm reading carnival girls now check it out you will not be disappointed fun stuff and just very very well done sir i always like to see people who actually uh, do what they say they're going to do for years very impressive as we keep on rolling it is time now for the PL statement what the heck happened in the options markets since our last episode let's find out with the PL statement all right all right a lot to catch up on here a lot lighting it up uh, let's go out to Mr. Matt first, kick things off. Obviously, a bit of an interesting vol regime, even since our last show. Mr. Matt, we have seen, I think you can call it a bit of a sell-off. Of course, since our last show, we have seen the invasion of Ukraine really kick into high gear. A lot of horrible things happening over there that have been weighing on the market. The Fed also weighing on the market a bit out there as well. And of course, commodity prices as a result of Ukraine have been exploding. That in turn is weighing on the market as well. So a lot of factors have combined and conspired to drag the broad indices a lot lower since our last show. Also, we're seeing volatility a lot higher as we're recording this show. VIX is still well into the 30s. So an intriguing time across the board. Mr. Matt we will start with you. What is catching your eye out there in the world of volatility and valuation since our last show, sir? Yeah, it's tough to keep your head in all this. There's uh, so much going on. I suggest uh, not watching so much uh, news and watch your numbers, uh, and, you know, if you're trading. So in, in numbers, of course, the level of volatility, uh, how, you know, that has since we were together a month ago, that is you know, steadily uh, risen. Uh, it looks like we're up. In, you know, from a from a God, we did we get down? I'm looking at the spy uh, uh, thirty day. It was around sixteen, and now it's you know doubled since the since the last time that we talked. So obviously that's a big uh, big factor there. Contango, uh, which is the front months versus the back months, have come down. So the the front months have gone up. Uh, quite a bit, um, which leads uh, it's, it, it, that's good for my uh, new favorite strategy, my 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 time spreads. So uh, that's been uh, kind of nice for those. And then you know I always look at uh, forward volatilities versus uh, flat volatilities, which is to say, uh, if you calculate the difference between like a 90 day volatility and a 30 day volatility. The, that 60 day difference right there has an implied volatility. And if you compare that to a, uh, a flat volatility, which is what is the volatility that <clears throat> your pricing formula will create what the time spread is worth. And that sounds like an odd number to look at, but that ratio uh, starts to uh, degrade when the market is in duress. So as th that that was actually the first thing that started to fall. So the, the, all these numbers help me out, kind of to to position uh, a little bit bef uh, maybe before it. Uh, we did get a slight tick up in um, in all of those factors. They're all kind of positive. Well, not volatility, but. Uh, in the in the last couple days, so uh, in, you know this uh, this was a big head fake day today. It went way down, and way up, and then it's come back down again. Uh, so uh, you know I've been watching a lot of that. Obviously, the volatility is quite high. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty out there. Uh, commodity prices have been pretty crazy. Nickel uh, went up 250 percent, and they closed the market. Uh, my favorite uh, metal, silver. Uh, has had some good days. Uh, obviously, gold is is doing well in this uncertainty. Uh, crypto's been kind of uh, 
I would call it flat and, and uninteresting. Um, as we've talked a lot about crypto in the past, my my take is, uh, you know, what we've learned in this uh, in these last few weeks, months is that the uh, the power of the state and how they want would, are not uh, shy to use it anymore. Uh, and unfortunately, I think what's going to happen is once they start introducing their digital currencies, they're not going to be too kind to, to the t- likes of Bitcoin and other uh, and, and other cryptos. So I'm, uh, you know, I've been ambivalent. Now I'm getting a little bit, uh, shall we say, negative uh, on the cryptos. But I love the bit the Bitto. Uh, the Bitto ETF allows us to uh, sell some calls and buy some puts. The SKU's nice. Uh, so you could collar your your uh, crypto positions. I know it, it, it uh, costs a little cash, but it's uh, I made my first trade on on this uh, on this channel. Uh, so I have to to thank you for that. So that's what I'm seeing out there, Mark. Oh, a convert to the Bitto options. You're right. If you're okay with a little bit of that negative roll yield, and it's not as much as people assumed initially as well, then yeah, it can be an interesting trading product, and you certainly. You have listed options on it that are pretty deep, pretty liquid. You know, it it's certainly has its its benefits out there if you do want to go the crypto route, even for you now, Mr. Matt, a growing crypto doubter out here, which is kind of interesting. Mr. Ash, now we turn to you. Like I mentioned, we haven't talked to you in quite some time. We know already what you were doing. You were spending your time very productively during the lockdown, but we haven't really had a chance to really chat with you since all this kicked off. So maybe let's start there for you really quickly Kind of give us your thoughts on the odyssey and evolution of the markets and volatility since that mad sell-off back in March of 2020, the explosion of vol, the general rally of the market since then, and of course, vol coming in until, of course, the start of this year where we saw everything popping off over the course of the past few weeks there. So a lot to catch us up on, sir. How about yeah, well, you know, a lot of things I would have considered like improbable or even crazy like are just like Tuesday now, you know? Uh, so you know, it's been, it's been a historic period for the world. Um, you know, as far as, you know, it's interesting. I, I was actually talking, you know, I, I talked to a lot of funds, a lot of, a lot of, you know, mall shops, um, or multi strats and, you know, um, uh, there, there seems to be like, you know, a, a week ago or two weeks ago before all this, this Ukraine stuff kicked off, you know, like the, the, the kind of questions that they were asking are like, you know, is there, is there a chance that like some of this geopolitical stuff? impacts the fed because you know the fed's obviously the, the big story uh and you know or like you know guys are like is it, is it possible that like you know the ecb you know bulks at, at some of the some of the, the hawkish hikes and all that kind of stuff and, and those are all very reasonable questions but guys it's different on this side of the pond this is like my first time in europe it's like dude there's there's russian tanks 800 miles like basically new york to chicago distance away attacking a city and like you know there was a reactor on fire with people shooting at it, like bigger than Chernobyl, right? So there is so like when people ask me, like, do you think that UCB could potentially like force all heights? It's like no one really on this side of the pond. Yeah, that's probably gonna happen. People are, you know, have had a dose of like reality. But interestingly enough, and and not to in any way, you know, um, take anything away from the human tragedy that's happening from a market perspective, it's been surprisingly orderly if you think about it, like. Um, you know, I think part of it was on the institutional side, people came in more hedged than they had in a long time, not in suspicion of anything in the Ukraine, but if the Fed hikes and they got, you know, they got the protection for the, the Ukraine. But then what's kind of happened is a lot of folks thought, as, as, as almost everyone did, that the Ukrainians would collapse immediately. That was kind of priced in. And they actually monetized those hedges, right? Like when, when, when they had the first fixed pop, well, that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems like this thing could last and potentially could get uglier with all sorts of, you know, different potential scenarios. So, you know, one of the questions people are asking was like, well, okay, it, what's the hedge now? I mean, now that the house is on fire, right? Like, where would you go? And, you know, one of the things that, that you know, historically, you know, when, when correlation goes to one, like when there's true fear in the markets, like the last instance of that was probably like the height of the pandemic, say, February or March in 2020, everything goes down. It doesn't matter. So when you're already in a crisis or, you know, when it's too late, like it's, you know, the VIX is where it is right now, you kind of want to find like the cheapest correlated vol you can, like an S&P component or something historically, which is what some of the managers I talked to 
have said, and which what I've done historically as well. And it can it can also it can, it can almost be something like that's exceedingly boring. Like for example, like you know the sector ETF XLU, the utility sector ETF. It's just if you look at it, it's still pretty much flat on the year. And people are like, well, why would you buy your protection there? I mean, it doesn't do anything. It usually doesn't do anything. But if you truly get fear, like you did the last time the market truly got fear was the height of the pandemic. You know, if you go, go back and check what XLU did, it was down February to March from like 70 to the mid 40s. It was down something like 30%, you know, in line with the market when all correlations went to one. Right. So since these things are hard to time and if people want to reach for protection, and if you tend to think this crisis could be extended and, you know, I'm kind of reminded from that scene in Bull Durham where they're they're having that little meeting on the on the mound when the pitcher can't you know the catcher comes out and you know Kevin Costner is <laughs> we're dealing with a lot of stuff <laughs> and it's hard to time so you know those are the kind of things that, that you know when, when I talk to funds or investors they're asking for like what's the best hedge in this scenario if you're not seeing as we're already in a higher vol regime so. You know, those are the kind of things I've been focused on lately. Ah, uh, yes, I forgot. Ash, you were the king of the the dubious correlations. We'll have to we'll have to do a whole segment about that again. One of my favorite presentations I've ever seen, listeners, was Ash's presentation at RMC a few years ago. Where, where did you compare the uh, number of hot vapor deaths to p- beauty pageant winners in Maine? Something along those lines. You had you had some great dubious correlations. Yeah. We should have a whole segment about just that, sir. Yeah, well, you know, the interesting thing too. I think I think I read something where, where Matt, Matt had written something. About a month ago, which seems like a lifetime ago, actually. <laughs> but uh, you know, where you know, he was saying like, you know, we use you know, option straddles for implied earnings moves, and like you know, Facebook, for example, it's really what a four, four and a half percent move. What did you get? Like, it's almost, it's almost, it seems like, you know, companies are really getting punished for missing and getting rewarded for beating, but all that against the potential headwind of the hikes, right? So, and that's probably. The expert on that at this point but uh you know he, he called it he called it perfectly yeah i'm glad you mentioned earning straddle sir because it is that time it is time for the earnings volatility report earnings announcements can move markets but what is the options market telling us about upcoming earnings events let's find out with the earnings volatility report all right everybody welcome to the earnings volatility report portion of the show where we let Matt off the chain with all of his various numbers and analysis out there for the world of earnings and volatility and how they intersect and how, of course, how they impact you and your clients' portfolios. And Matt, Ash even said, even there all the way across the pond, he's being inundated with your earnings volatility analysis, sir. So it is reaching far and wide. Well done. Yeah, thanks, Ash. But uh, this has been another one of those earnings seasons, Mark, that we uh, where where it's it's conflated with a very high vol event. You know, obviously we had the COVID, and now uh, this one. So this started off without the uh, Ukraine situation, and we were getting some some nice moves in the in the uh, in the straddles for the owners. So we you know we paid off twelve percent to the positive. And then it got a little ugly. The second week, third week, and fourth week were uh, good for straddle owners. Uh, you know what we do in the earnings season report is we we break it down by the six weeks of the earnings season. Basically, is how we summarize it. And we use what we've seen, you know, day in and day out, earnings in and earnings out, is uh, that week three and especially four are the ones that pay off and. And that's the, uh, the way it's been this this uh, earnings season. Finally, we had some life uh, to earnings. So, uh, uh, you know, after waiting uh, through the pandemic, we we started to get some good volatility. But then, you know, now we're in a, in a situation, and and there's still some stragglers out there, uh, you know, that are that are reporting. But you know, a lot of what's in their straddle is Ukraine and not just the earnings. So, uh, you know, the season itself was a. Uh, 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 I think a healthy season. Um, one of the things that we've added to our uh, front end dashboard product is uh, some more fundamental earnings analysis. So uh, we're looking at uh, analysts, we're looking at actual earnings uh, numbers, uh, not just the volatility components. So that, that's that been a lot of fun to, to look at. And I think that people are starting to uh, make earnings great again and look at the actual fundamentals of companies um you know we're seeing these 
these long duration uh, stocks uh, really get pummeled um, as the Fed uh, threatens to raise rates. Th those stocks so with the uh, earnings well into the future are, are, are going to uh, get hurt a lot more than you know the stronger companies. So we're seeing now uh, you know some some companies that are that are actually uh, reporting uh, reasonable earnings that that you can you know there's a number of analysts and where they they do a decent job predicting. If they're missing those, as Ash said, you know they're getting punished, and if they're uh, you know if they're making their earnings, they're getting rewarded. So it's kind of we're getting back to uh, at least some normalcy, I think, in the market itself. There's some you know some stocks out there. Uh, you might even start hearing value stocks again. And, and when you start talking like value stocks, you start seeing earnings and you start seeing that earnings that, that matter a lot more. So, so that's the, uh, that's the earnings report We're we're kind of at the tail end of, of, of earnings season. Um, you know, this was a, this was a good one, Mark. So I, I, I think we might be back in business for, uh, as far as earnings mattering more, uh, the predictivity of, of our uh, analysis and, uh, um, you know, we're, as you know, we've, we've continued to add to the number of reports that come out, including some, uh, uh, some time spreads, calendars that, that might uh, be a good play um, during the earnings season, Mark. Yeah, if nothing else, listeners, if nothing else, if you're not intrigued at all by the earnings volatility and its impact on your broad portfolio, some of the earnings trades that Matt and his team have been uh, cooking up there and are tracking and analyzing. Might be some interesting food for thought for you as you're looking at your own and your clients' portfolios and see maybe how you should weather the storm during these earnings season. And it was quite the interesting storm, as Matt alluded to. I have the numbers here for the final report for the season, and you can find this for yourselves, theoptionsinsider.com. Click on that Options News and Articles tab. You'll see earnings season reports there. Just scroll back down to the report from February 23rd, that is the final report for the season there. And you'll see exactly what Matt was talking about. We kind of got out of the gate with a bang, 112%. Remember, 100% would be a break even. How much was priced into all the straddles versus how much was delivered. 112% means we actually made money. You made money if you were out there buying a basket of straddles. And if you bought that same proverbial basket the next week of all the names that were reporting the next week, you lost money because it was 74%. Then week three, breaking it again, 109% to the upside. Week four, 107% to the upside. Week five, 93%, so losing a little bit there. Week six, not the best, 43%. It's one of the worst weeks we've seen in quite some time, but also not a huge not a huge frame of reference there because only 58 firms reporting that week versus let's say 233 in week 4 so pretty much a fourth the sample size of what you had in some of the other more active weeks that's probably why those numbers were pretty stark towards the end of the season but still very interesting stuff and uh, pretty much outperforming the average we've had now since the start of the pandemic which is about 88% getting in about 91% so you know, Matt and I, if you've been listening to this show for a while, we've been waiting and wondering when we're going to get that moment. It kind of started last cycle, so not this past cycle, but the one before it, where we saw earnings vol really starting to kick in a bit. Because pretty much for me, one of the biggest surprises since the start of the pandemic has been the fact that earnings analysis, earnings volatility, none of that mattered. Every single season, we saw vol just coming in and coming in and coming in, and a name could report almost anything. It didn't matter, and the vol would get annihilated. And that happened cycle after cycle for coming up on three years until the last few cycles. We finally started to break that pattern. And this past season is pretty much another example of that. Ash, you just mentioned you've seen Matt's analysis about Facebook vol. Is this something that comes across your radar as you're out there doing research and looking at correlations for funds out there? Uh, the notion of what's been going on in the earnings volatility realm. And also, I'm curious if you were as surprised as I was that since the onset of the pandemic, really until the last four or five months, we really haven't seen earnings volatility really mean that much in the sense that a firm could pretty much do anything and they would just annihilate the vol after the announcement regardless. Did that surprise you as much as it did me, sir? Yeah, it, it, it did. And, you know, the, the Facebook, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a bit in the rearview mirror, you know, <laughs> a month ago. But, but you know, it, it was quite telling uh, in that, you know, they came out and they, you know, they they posted their number and it was down what it was. And, and, you know, I think it was a Thursday and, and there was, there was limit, you know, Friday expect one day option, 5% out of the money. So it's down 
you know, and you're buying the 5% out of the money call, uh, just buying on the dip because it's like an entire generation of traders has been conditioned to do that. <laughs> right. And it, it was really interesting because, you know, there's definitely been you know, a cat and mouse game between retail and professional or, you know, institutional investors, whatever you want to call it over the past year with the whole GameStop thing. That, that thing kind of seems to have ended, but, you know, one of the things we, you know, we, we, we try to look at flows and when we look at the flows of the inflows right after Facebook, you know, for example, like, you know, UBS with their, you know, uh, with their, you know, their Schwab acquisition and, and you know, their market making platform, you know, th- that's probably a reasonable proxy for retail. And a lot of the inflows that we were seeing from like those types of reports, people buying Facebook after the, the first dip were in institutions, like all the institutions, all, all the funds I was talking to are like, well, on a value basis, I can't do it because they're throwing all the money at this meta thing. On a growth basis, you know, the, the sales projections are not in line with growth. We're not going to touch it. We'd rather own options on Amazon or Microsoft. You know, so it seemed like it was more the retail investors, you know, buying, you know, the, the you know the Facebook and that sort of thing, uh, as we've all been conditioned over the past decade, right? So it seems that there might be some factors that are, as Matt was saying, and calling, you know, a return to normalcy or to what we are more familiar with for most of our career, where valuations start to matter and volatility, you know has a bit of a floor to it, given the, the levels of uncertainty and the headwinds that, you know, that we're, we're potentially looking at, both geopolitically and fiscally. Yes, the BTFD crowd stepped in, and unfortunately for them, they kind of caught a bit of a falling knife. I mean, it's crazy. Looking at just this chart of Facebook right now, six months ago, it was pretty much $400, pretty close, and now it's shy of 200 193 today hit uh, 187 and a half. By the way, just really quick, Matt mentioned it earlier. What an insane day we are having today trough to peak so the bottom to the top out there in the s&p right now it's about a 110 point range on the s&p it got down to about oh looks like about 41.64 and a high of 42.74 before selling off now we're pretty much back to almost unch so an insane day out there yet again but as you mentioned earlier pretty much that's par for the course now these days every insane day is kind of normal but ash was just mentioning all the flows out there we're going to get to that right now it is time to get the buzz. Busy financial advisors don't have time to follow the latest developments from the options market, so we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right, buddy. Welcome to the buzz, the portion of the show where we do just that. We get the buzz, see what's going on out there in the world of options and derivatives. Maybe something you've been missing because you've been busy paying attention to your clients, which you definitely should be doing right now. These are insane times we are all living through together. Uh, Let's just dive right into it right here because the story we've been talking about pretty much ever since the onset of the pandemic has been this amazing, just just tsunami of options volume, particularly out there in the retail side, as Ash was alluding to, where people have been discovering and embracing these products in just record numbers month over month, year over year. We kept wondering, we kept asking, can this party continue? I was on the record as being a cynic last year. I didn't think coming into the start of last year, it seemed like we had such unique conditions that created the massive explosion in volume in 2020. We couldn't replicate that. And lo and behold, not only did we, we blew the doors off, coming in on close to 10 billion contracts towards the end of the year there in 2021. So now, of course, the question on everyone's lips coming into 2022 Can we keep that up? Can we match that? Can the party continue? And the answer for January was yes. Pretty much every month since the pandemic, it has been month over month growth. It has been certainly year over year growth. And whatever the January, the February, whatever month it was compared to the year before, it has been up. Uh, This February finally broke that trend. We have the numbers now in our hands from our friends over there at OCC. And February, pretty much the first year over year down month since the start of the pandemic. February total volume down 2.6% from February of 2021. Now, February of last year, as you'll recall, listeners, that was no slouch. That was pretty much full tilt meme stock madness. Everyone and their mother was buying GameStop and AMC and everything else under the sun. So it was a pretty unique, rarefied month. But February of this year, also no slouch. We, of course, had the Ukrainian invasion, the build up to it, all the comings and goings with the Fed, as well as earnings season. So there were a lot of drivers this February that should have probably put us over the top, not to mention the fact that there are just more players out there now 
than there were a year ago in the options market. We did check before showtime. Sometimes there's fewer trading days in the month, so that could game the numbers. But that is not the case here. Actually, 19 days last February, 19 trading days this February as well. So no difference there. So it really is just a straight year-over-year decrease. February total volume, 807.3 million contracts. Like I said, down 2.6%. You'll also notice a bit of a ways from that number we've been looking at for a while now. These monthly numbers have been threatening 1 billion contracts a month. We haven't quite hit that yet. We got about 930, I believe, 940, somewhere in that range. So 807, obviously well below that as well. And obviously also compared to other months, total volume, February is a short month. So 19 trading days, you're probably not going to threaten 1 billion contracts. But it still is interesting that we are down year over year. Also, the ADV for February was down down slightly less, though, down about 0.7% to 437 million contracts. So interesting numbers out there. Mr. Matt, I will turn to you first. This has been something obviously we've been talking about for a couple of years now is can this party continue? I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. Is this the first real chink in the armor? Is the tsunami starting to fizzle or is this just kind of a weird one month aberration and we're back to it next month, sir? Well, I'm going to stay with my thesis and my thesis is Uh, The more the Fed prints, the more options volume there is. And I think that they're indicating that they may may not be printing as much. So I'm I'm getting a little bearish on the option volume. Um, And then I was just checking. uh, uh, One of the things I look at is the width uh, market width, the bid ask width in um, ball points, kind of normalized to ball points. And we have uh, a way to... Um, component weight the results. So I'm looking at the S&P 500 stocks, component weighted, and uh, wondering how wide the markets are. And they did get pretty wide. And now they're kind of at a, uh, a, a you know, I would say a, a fairly wide point, uh, five vol points wide on average. Um, of course, I wrote a lot during the uh, pandemic crash uh, that those spreads just got ridiculously wide up to 20 in the 20s, vol points wide. Uh, Now there there have been spikes and now we're kind of experiencing a spike. So, um, you know, that this speaks to. Uh, again, the, the market makers, the few market makers there are, they really kind of widen out in during market duress. Um, and so that that's uh, the same thing that they're doing right now is, uh, you know, the markets are quite wide. So, yeah, I, I'm a little bearish on the uh, on the volume um, in the, this uh, this correction that we're in, um, you know, is causing some, uh, you know, obviously volatility and market uh, width increases. And I think that actually hurts some of the volume um, often. So, you know, obviously the the spy stays and, you know, and the big stocks, that's where they tend to concentrate uh, these market makers that is. Uh, but the uh, on the smaller component stocks, they're getting pretty wide. Um, you know, that's somewhat related to the discussion, but you know, I'm a little, I'm a little bearish Mark. Oh, bearish on crypto bearish on overall <laughs> options volume. <laughs> you're starting to play the Andrew role on the show. You're kind of just the cynic. You're bringing us all down here, Matt. Let's go, let's go across the pond to Mr. Osh. Let's see if we, can, if we can shake things up, maybe lighten things up a little bit. Mr. Osh, I'm curious for you. What are your thoughts? Have you been following this story now that you're far across the pond and looking at other issues, the notion that options volume has done nothing but grow pretty much every month and year over year since the pandemic? Until pretty much last month, until pretty much February. Are you like Matt? You think maybe with the Fed dialing it back, that may have a bit of a weight on overall options volume? Or do you think things are still going to be rocketing for some time to come? Well, I I never like to disagree with Matt when it comes to options. Uh, But you're going to. Go for it. Zinger. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the only thing is, is once again, once again, guys, you know, I'm on this side of the pond, right? So, you know, take that in perspective. So maybe I'm a little skewed here. But I think... Option vol- options, but, but the asymmetric nature of options is very useful in sideways markets. And I think that's kind of what we're going to get so far. I mean, because if, if I'm trying, I was, you know, as a guy I used to run a tail fund, I was trying to figure out a historic precedent for this. 
there may not be one. And obviously history, you know, doesn't repeat itself. Maybe it rhymes. But I, I went back to the Yom Kippur War of 73, right? Because that was, you know, a, a conflict uh, with inflationary uh, parameters to it. And then a potential embargo with oil and that sort of thing. And it really lasted for a while. I mean, in the opening stages, the markets were doing just about what they're doing now. And then a year down the road, they were significantly lower. And, you know, when I when I sit there and I look at, you know, the, the potential here for the geopolitical stuff, I don't think there was a quick solution. I think that's what was priced in. People thought that was going to happen. You know, this Ukraine conflict, I don't think it's going to be anytime quickly. It could get uglier. Uh, I mean, it's it's very... You know, it's inspirational to see, you know, the level of courage and gallantry the Ukrainians are showing, but the Russians have a big army and Russian presidents who lose wars don't survive. So neither side's going to stop. And, you know, you still have the Fed. What's, what's the Fed and ECB going to do into this? And you still have you know, the whole oil issue. Like, could oil hit 150? Well, how does that historically when you have spikes in oil, you know, that, that tends to impact the markets as well. So, you know, I'm not necessarily doom and gloom, but I, I think this could be a protracted you know, sideways affair until all this gets sorted out. And options are a very useful instrument in, 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 in those types of situations. So um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going to happen to option volumes going forward. I'm going to read that into you saying, yes, options are going to blow the doors off. Matt saying no. So we have a point counterpoint. It's kind of like McLaughlin <laughs> group here. Everyone's fighting back and forth with contrasting views here. That's a dated reference if ever there was one. But you know what, listeners, you folks are very patient with this show. We love you all. You send in bucket loads of questions, and we very rarely have time to get to them. So I want to see if we could squeeze as many of you as we can in the time remaining. So let's get to a little bit of the old office hours. It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on the optionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at the optionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or stocktwits.com slash options insider. All right, everybody, welcome to the office hours, the portion of the show where we endeavor to answer as many of your questions as humanly possible. <laughs> Let's get to this first one here from Adrian Lamos. He wants to know, I've thought about substituting my client's stock positions with call options with long time expiration dates. However, someone informed me that option strategies as a replacement for underlying equities will always carry additional costs and hassles. Thoughts? That's, that's interesting. I don't know who told you that, Adrian, because it's not exactly correct information. One of the nice things about swapping your underlying for options is it is very much cost and capital efficient, much more cost effective to do it that way than it is to do it with the equities for a variety of reasons. Obviously, options are a leveraged instrument, so you're taking advantage of that. So you're actually going to be freeing up capital. In terms of other costs, they still are commissions on options versus not on stocks. So maybe that's what they're referring to. That's such a small incidental cost. That shouldn't really factor at all into whether you're going to do a longer term sizable trade like this or not. And I'm curious for you, Mr. Matt, what do you think for Adrian? He's a little nervous about doing stock substitution, something which you mentioned, I believe, recently on the show that you're a fan of in this environment. Uh, he's nervous about doing it because he says it will, quote, carry additional costs and hassles for his clients, sir. Yeah, I, I could understand them. You know, it has to I, I'm thinking it's it's carry costs. Theta, um, is is probably what he's referring to. Also, the fact that you don't get dividends, but it's priced in the option uh, generally. So, uh, and then, you know, if you're, if you have a rolling strategy, sometimes, you know, there are, as I mentioned earlier, some wide markets, um, and slippage there. So uh, those are the major, uh, stumbling blocks and, and hurdles I would, uh, I would imagine. Um, I don't know if it, maybe from a tax standpoint, if you're, if you're not doing, uh, leaps, if you're, if, you, know, you might have some additional, uh, 
tax burden there. But, uh, you know, those are the those are the three things that I could think about, uh, Mark. So, you know, I mean, it's something to consider. Uh, you know, some people are used to getting dividends and um, you're not going to get those with a call. Some people, uh, you know, might see the call, the value of the call go up or down uh, over time. Uh, the, in, in, you know, the, and that could have to do with volatility. Uh, as well. So, I mean, if, if you're buying even leaps, you know, they're, they're, the vol has gone up. So as those come down, uh, you know, that you could lose a little bit there. So there, you know, there are some considerations definitely. Uh, but, you know, the, the advantage obviously is, is the capital and also the downside. You know, if you're buying a call, you're not, you're not spending the, uh, I don't know, the average price of, of some of our stocks in our database is like in the hundreds now. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, so much higher than it used to be. Um, you know, that's a lot of capital to tie up. So th that's my, uh, that, those are my thoughts on that question, Mark. Yeah, I can definitely see the argument made for hassle. It's more involved from a labor perspective than just buying and holding stocks, certainly. So from that perspective, I can maybe see, but you're, that's your job as the advisor. You want to provide that extra level of service, especially in this day and age. Otherwise, people will go elsewhere. Interesting thought, and definitely from a capital perspective, it is much more efficient. Start slow. Don't go crazy. You don't have to go the fig leaf route and leg into diagonals to try to do synthetic covered calls like Ryan's always talking about on his options playbook radio. Start slowly. Go longer term. We've talked about stock substitution many times in the archives of this program, as well as our options boot camp program. Go check those out for our preferred structure, our preferred approach. Start simple. Go slow. And I think you'll definitely find the rewards definitely outweigh the quote-unquote hassles that you mentioned there, Adrian. Oh, let's keep on rolling. Got to squeeze more people in here. Let's go to this one. Zero year. I like that handle. He says, hello, AO crew. Well, hello, zero year. He says, uh, I'm loving the show as always. Well, thank you. I'd like to know your thoughts on how these exploding commodity prices might impact the equity volatility regime going forward. All things being equal, higher input prices should put downward pressure on equity valuations and therefore higher equity volatility as we move down the skew. Is that a correct view or am I being too reductive? Mr. Osh, first off, really quickly, if you've got anything you want to add on the stock substitution question from Adrian, have at it. And then B, uh, for Mr. Zero Year, he wants to know, what do you think the impact of these exploding commodity prices will be on equity volatility going forward? Okay, uh, first, you know, I, I agree with Matt. I mean, I, I think that there are definitely some costs and you have to do your due diligence, but the asymmetric properties of options you know, particularly with a bunch of, you know, unknown unknowns that we're facing as a planet, um, it, it's a very useful tool. You know, equity replacement options is a very useful tool in uncertain times. Um, for um, Mr. Zero Year's question, uh, you know, it, it's interesting because, you know, you, you do have, you know, commodity prices, you know, you know, through the roof, you have, you know, FX, you have volatility in the 99th percentile across the board, you know, you have the VIX at, at a higher level. But if you think about it, you know, in in two thousand in two thousand, um, you know, was it eleven with with, with the, uh, the 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 downgrade the August with the U.S. debt downgrade, the VIX is higher than it is right now. And look at the issues we're facing right now. Like the VIX, you know, with the pandemic was at eighty. It's at a thirty four handle right now. With all of these other commodity and FX vols over there, there's a lot more room for VIX and you know equity volatility expansion. Uh, given given some of the catalysts, you know, the world is looking at right now. So I you know I I would you know I would be cautious uh, about that. I, I think that, I think his 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 notion is is fairly reasonable that this commodity and you know volatility and the other asset classes could very easily spill over to equities and equities. Given everything that's going on, the VIX isn't that high right now. We do have a literal shooting war in Europe where they're actually shelling nuclear reactors. So <laughs> what's the appropriate level for VIX under that scenario? I ask you, listeners. Mr. Matt, any thoughts here for Mr. Zero Year? And what are your thoughts about his analysis of the impact of higher commodity prices on equity vols? Well, I, I like it. I, I mentioned it earlier how uh, nickel has gone way up. You know, Russia, uh, you know, it seems like we're not going to be trading with them. They have a lot of... Uh, of these minerals that were that are necessary for industry, so it's it's definitely going to put some uh, some pressure on equity valuations, as zero year uh, mentions. And um, you know, as far as volatility goes, um, you know, and moving down the skew, that I, I, that's where I don't really well, you know, because he's he's saying as as equity prices go down, yeah, you're moving down the skew. 
sometimes you'll get the skew flattening. I, I, I don't think he's referring to the skew itself. I think he's referring to uh, as stocks go down, vol goes up. So, that, you know, that's definitely true. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with him. I, uh, you know, a, a good thing to do what, when you're looking at volatility in the market is to look at rates, FX, and now commodities. And commodity uh, vol is way through the roof. So it, it, it uh, does permeate through all of the markets. So, um, yeah, I think you, you, I think it's a good idea to look at, at other volatilities, um, you, you know, the making the, the chips. Um, that's, you know, that's one of the bigger uh, uh, inputs that we're seeing right now that that's affected um, and batteries and, and, and whatnot. So I, I think it's a good point that, that zero years making, Mark. All right, we got time looks like here for one more. So I'll leave it up to you guys. You guys can choose. Do you want to do covered calls on crypto or do you want to do hedging and the S&P 500 correlation versus the fangs? Choose now or forever hold your peace. No you got to choose that, Mark. No one's choosing. All right, I guess I'll choose. <laughs> All right. I know Ash is the king of uh, dubious correlations. So maybe we'll do this one about the correlation here. Let's see. Let's go to Christopher. He says, is there some way to play this epic underperformance of the FANG stocks versus the S&P 500 right now? Conversely, does this mean that it's too late to buy protection on these names because the put volatility will be too high? He included a graph. I think this came from the uh, Wall Street Journal's Daily Shot newsletter, uh, which shows a chart of the S&P 500 right now. And at the time of this, which was early March, it was run. S&P 500 is off about 5%. And then it, they compare it to the NYSE FANG Plus Index, which is, again, primarily the FANG names there. And that's down nearly 20%. A lot of that, of course, is coming from the the Facebook annihilation out there. But still, heavy tech has underperformed of late. That is that is inarguable. Uh, so yes, 5% versus about 20%. Obviously, dramatic underperformance. Mr. Osh, perhaps we'll start with you as the king of dubious correlations. Uh, what are your thoughts on this relative underperformance of the FANGs versus the S&P? Do you have any thoughts about how uh, Mr. Christopher should be approaching this? And also, he's concerned that it's maybe too late to buy some protection on the FANG names. What do you think about that? So kind of a three-part. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. Like, I think the S&P 500 for the past couple of years has been a misnomer. I mean, I think it's been the S&P 495 because it's pretty much been flat X fang going back to 2019 before all this craziness started, right? So, you know, it, 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 you know, there are components of FANG taking some pain, but you've also had some you know, some pretty compelling S&P moves as well. And, and you know, I, I think when, when if you do think you're going to get a coordinated, correlated move down, which is basically a, you know, byproduct of real fear hitting the market, a la, you know, the financial crisis or the pandemic, things get worse, you know, it, it, it you know, yeah, I mean, like you know, things like Facebook, those things are those things are price heavy right now. But like components of the S and P, like some of the sector ETFs, like utilities, that sort of thing, it doesn't seem you know very dynamic. But if you look at periods where the market where fear hits the market, correlation goes to one, and everything goes down together, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can get some pretty dynamic protection from some fairly innocuous looking sectors of the S and P, which are probably cheaper puts right now uh, than definitely any of the fangs. Or the you know the, the index as a whole. So when, when you're when you're looking for orderly moves down, you always want the cheapest possible correlated hedge because uh, it's hard to time these things. And you know those are the kind of things that I would be looking at right now. By the way, do you have to change it to Mang now that Facebook is Meta? I just thought of that. That has much worse <laughs> ring than Fang. I, I can't get behind Mang at all. Uh, Mr. Matt, your thoughts here on the underperformance of the Mang stocks. Versus the S&P 500. And Christopher also wants to know if he's too late, if the horse is out of the barn when it comes to buying puts on these things. Well, I think that, that I, I really like uh, Asha's approach with the all the correlations go to to, uh, to one and buy the lowest fall. Diamonds, uh, XLU, I've been doing that forever. Uh, that's a, that, that is uh, one of the best uh, things to do from a, from a uh, hedging perspective. Um, another thing to note is if you look at, you know, I just went on my, my charting service and, and put in uh, FANG over SPY back, you know, but if you start it back in 2000, they're about equal right now. So the underperformance, you know, is only because of a lot of overperformance. And again, it comes back to, to I think, the, the, the thought that we were talking about earlier, how a lot of these uh, longer duration stocks like FANG stocks 
are these interest rates are really going to hurt them. Um, and yeah, the, I think it is too late to hedge right now. But you know, and uh, I would follow uh, what uh, what Ash is saying if you if you're really looking for some puts. Um, and but I don't think that that relationship is that abnormal right now. I think it it still could have a way to go, i.e., the Fang um, versus Spy. So um, the, the XLU, the diamonds, the the lower volatility uh, uh, market. Um, sector and and index uh, relationships can be a, a, a better way to go for for hedging your overall por- portfolio. Uh, but again, I, I wouldn't put uh, a, a ton of, you know, I wouldn't be like buying the fang and selling spy because of that graph. You know, look look at a longer term graph, um, and and um, look at some of of the fundamentals that have changed, i.e., the uh, longer term you know, the discounting of, of their future cash flows is, is going to be pretty brutal for the FANG. So that's how I'd look at that, Mark. Great questions, everybody. We tried to squeeze as many of you in as we can. I know still many of you are waiting. Wait patiently. Don't worry. We'll get to you. If we can't get you on this show, we'll try to rotate you on some other programs. So you don't have to wait too long. So keep those questions coming. Unfortunately, that music means we are done for this episode. But don't worry. We'll be back before too long. Another episode of the advisor's option coming at you in a couple of weeks out there. But before we go, Mr. Osh, it was a joy having you back on the show again after a too extended of a hiatus, even though you put it to good use. If folks want to check out any of your research or your dubious correlations or what you're working on with your fund, or like I mentioned at the top of the show, they want to dive into the world of internationally renowned novelist and author, AK Vias. Where should they go? What should they do? Oh, well, you know, um, you know, we, we do have some, you know, interesting things going on at Residence. You know, we're, we're currently in the process of launching a fund of funds to help institutional investors with their hedge fund investments. So, um, you know, um, contact us at Residence, uh, if, you know, as a family office or uh, an institution. Um, and, you know, the books are the books. They're on Amazon. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's great to uh, catch up with you guys again. Soon to be Hugo Award winning, <laughs> AK be awesome. Check them out. Carnival Girls is the most recent one. I definitely encourage you to check it out. If you like kind of a bit of an internationally tinged Silence of the Lambs type book, I'm, I'm about part of the way through. I'm, I'm on a boat right now, Mr. Mr. Osh, with some bad dudes. That's all I'm going to say. And I, just, I just got to Crete, so that'll give you a sense of of where I am in the whole adventure of Carnival Girls. If you want to check out Resonance, listeners, it's R-E-S-O-N-A-N-Z. Resonance with a Z there. Check them out for all of Ash's research and analysis, what they have going on over there. And Mr. Matt, we were talking earlier about your various reports, the earnings move, earnings move results, earnings season, the newly minted and very interesting earnings trades reports. But every time you come on the show, you got something new up your sleeve. So if you got anything new you want to share with the folks have at it, sir. Yeah, and and I want to thank you because we did have some uh, people come over and kick the tires on our new dashboard. Uh, so please, if you want to try out a, a nice front end with a stock scanner with some fundamentals and, and IVs and HVs, earnings and dividends, uh, and then you could, you could come up with the stocks and ETFs that you want to look at, you could send it to our option scanner, you could sort on our forecast falls and what has the best edge if you think the market's going up three percent and there's just all kinds of great stuff like that you can right click on it and go to our analyzer and see what the news is bullish or bearish and you could go and see how the earnings have performed over the last 12 quarters and you can uh, do all kinds of stuff this in our new option chain has some just awesome graphs to show which months are out of whack or what skews are out of whack so we're having a we're having a lot of fun and, and we're working hard over at O-Rats and, and uh, Matt at O-Rats, M-A-T-T at O-R-A-T-S dot com if you want to try out some of these and, and uh, kick the tires and give us some feedback. So that's what's up over at O-Rats, Mark. Hit them up, Matt at O-Rats, O-R-A-T-S dot com if you want to try out the new cool bleeding edge stuff Matt and his team are working out of. I know a lot of you, especially in our secret club, would be perfect people. To kick the tires on that, matt at orats.com or hit us up. We'll forward you on to Matt 
if you are so inclined, because I think you folks would be great ones to bang away at the system and see what's going on over there. And speaking of seeing what's going on, you want to learn more about this whole options thing and how you can implement it for your clients. Optionseducation.org is the place you need to go. Our friends over at the Options Industry Council have you covered a wide variety of educational articles and webinars, even some podcasts there and everything else over there. Right now they have a big series on demystifying the Greeks. You can get all that and a whole bunch more. Optionseducation.org is the place to go. I'm pleased to also say the wide world of options will be returning to the network after a bit of a hiatus during the pandemic. So that's also the show coming at you directly from the folks over there at OIC. So stay tuned for that coming sometime soon (laughs) in the near future. And on behalf of everybody over there at OIC and Mr. Matt, and of course, world renowned author, Mr. Ash Vyas and indeed myself. I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live. We love you all. We'll be back. If you're listening live, gear up because we got a great pro Q&A session coming up. Mr. Matt, the short, excuse me, Mr. Matt, Mr. Don, the short vol and legend and blackjack Hall of Famer is back. And I got a feeling he's itching to talk some high level card counting with you folks and all the math and analysis that goes into it. So he is, I think to say super giddy is an understatement. He is very excited to talk to you folks he has prepared a wealth of information for you so i'm not sure how many of your questions we'll have time to get to but get them in if you get them in early we'll probably try to squeeze them in but he is pumped he is raring to go that is coming up let's see i believe that is coming up in about half an hour so if you're listening live just yeah half an hour actually 20 minutes now for Mr. Don. So get ready, get a beverage. We'll be back in about 20 minutes, with Mr. Don. Uh, tomorrow, of course, Options Boot Camp, Options Playbook Radio, back again on Thursday with episode two of the Option Block and Twifo Friday Ball Views. And for all you Secret Club folks, Options Oddities after that. And actually, just in a couple of weeks, we'll be back with another episode of the Advisor's Option. Stay safe out there, everybody. Advisors Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisors Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop option strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com.